Well, hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today from wherever you're calling in from. We're really excited to spend the next 90 minutes together talking about forward leaning uh, relationship based access. So just to get us started, I thought I would give you a little bit of the lay of the land, how we plan to spend our time together. Uh, and and then we'll get going into the into the interesting piece of it all. I see some of you are introducing yourself in the chat and I encourage everybody to do so. It's really nice to see who's out there where you're calling in from uh, and 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 what what brings what's your interest what brings you into into this conversation. So we welcome you here. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to the session that is co-hosted today by the permanent mission of the Kingdom of the Netherlands to the United States to the United Nations, pardon me, and other international organizations in Geneva and Nonviolent Peace Force, an INGO working on civilian protection. As I said, today we'll be focusing on forward leading relationship based access. We'll be exploring, exploring our experiences in places like South Sudan, Iraq, Sudan and Ukraine and learning about what access means to people most impacted by violence how we can work together with communities impacted by violence to create mutually protective access and what some of the challenges are in the work that we do. We're going to get started very shortly with opening remarks and then we'll be looking for your input. We'll do a Mentimeter exercise as Julie mentioned in the introduction. So looking for your thoughts and ideas on about access and we'll get to that shortly. And then we're going to have an opportunity to hear and see um, about stories and voices from different places through getting to watch some videos. So we have videos from all the countries that I've mentioned. We'll start with, with South Sudan and Iraq and watch a couple of videos from those locations. And then we've got some great speakers from each of those places who will share with us about their experiences and, and you'll have an opportunity to ask some questions. And then we will move on and we'll, we'll do the same thing for Sudan and, and Ukraine. And then we'll wrap up at the end and that should bring us to the end of our session together. So let's get started without waiting anymore. It's my honor and, and distinct pleasure to, to introduce you to, to Mr. Andre Van He's the first Secretary Humanitarian Affairs for the Permanent Representation of Kingdom of the Netherlands here in Geneva and our partner in co-facilitating, co-hosting this event. Um, and Andre is going to get us started with some opening remarks. So I hand the floor to you, Andre. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Tiffany. And uh, let me join you in welcoming everybody uh, throughout the world. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. It's great to have you all here in such uh, great numbers. Uh, and um, it's an honor for, for us uh, from the Netherlands uh, to co-organize this, uh, this workshop uh, with the uh, Nonviolent Peace Force, uh, which is an important partner for us in, in, in amongst others, uh, Iraq and in South Sudan, uh, of which we will see uh, some examples of, of their work there in, in the next uh, couple of minutes, uh, an hour. Um, protection of civilians uh, is... Uh, you know, important part of Dutch policy, um, for starters, the title of our humanitarian policy brief is uh, People First, which uh, really alludes to, uh, you know, international humanitarian law and, and protecting people. Likewise, safety of people and the safety of communities is also central to our security and rule of law policy. And defending human rights in general is a cornerstone of, uh, of our foreign policy. And that too, of course, is about ensuring that people's rights are uh, uh, protected um, uh, and their, yeah, their rights are protected. And defending and improving uh, the position of women and girls in particular is also key to our feminist foreign policy. Um, and finally, I wanted to mention another policy area that is important uh, for us, uh, which is uh, uh, mental health and psychosocial support. Uh, that is obviously not uh, limited to protection, but in our view, uh, it certainly is an important part of making sure that people in crisis situations have the resilience also uh, later on to overcome that crisis. So having said all that, uh, it's clear that protection and the safety of people and the safety of communities is a priority for us, uh, as it is for many of you uh, having joined uh, us today. Um, but it would be a mistake to reduce it to some niche of humanitarian action, um, which often happens. Uh, I mean, that is something you already knew, but which is something that uh, for me uh, was something that I discovered uh, since arriving here in Geneva 
where I'm based, uh, two and a half years ago. And uh, as I arrived, I was uh, really fresh to the world of humanitarian affairs. And when I arrived, um, I went through a steep learning curve about the humanitarian system, about humanitarian principles, and about humanitarian coordination and humanitarian clusters, and about humanitarian delivery and access. And it all seemed very technical. And it wasn't technical. It was all, very, if it wasn't technical, it was all very neutral and independent. You know, don't rock the boat, don't jeopardize the access. And all this made very much sense when you think about the delivery of aid, for instance, the delivery of wash or shelter or food or even education and health. And it even in that same vein of thought uh, seemed uh, to make sense when thinking about protection. Until I started to realize that protection is not a technical issue at all. Uh, that in essence, it's not just aid to be delivered. Of course, it has also that element when we talk about protection, but it is so much more fundamental. Protection is at the heart of the matter. Protection, humanitarian principles, and humanitarian access, even human rights. These are all different sides of the same coin, and they are different aspects of the life of persons facing life-threatening realities. And I think this is reflected in this year's theme for the Global Protection Forum protection for access, and in the workshop uh, today, which is uh, forward-leaning, relationship-based access. I mean, all this is not a discovery for you, but it was and is more and more so for me. And I believe it puts the concept of humanitarian principles in a much more activist light. Sure, the principles are there to ensure humanitarian access, and in particular, access to all those affected without distinction. But beyond that, the protection of people is something that needs to be actively defended and promoted. We are not neutral or independent. Or let me put it differently, if neutrality means standing for the rights of all people, including those most in need, then we are indeed neutral. So all this to say that protection and access go hand in hand and are not mutually exclusive. I guess my main message uh, today in this opening is that it's not only access for protection, but it's protection for access. We need protection for the access. It's not just talking about access. And that means not looking at protection of civilians as a service to provide for which access is needed, but to look at it holistically in terms of community safety and security. It means that the perspective and agency of people should be central as well as the responsibilities of state and non-state actors, of course. So it's the needs of and the agency of the people that is central, not the narrow technical goals of access. Because safety and security implies access as well as people's well-being. And the other way around, they are inherently intertwined. And I think that's the message today. And that in turn points us to today's discussion, durable access. Access is often spoken in terms, spoken of in terms of negotiations, the idea being that we need to negotiate access to provide aid. It is a quid pro quo often, but that is not a durable proposition. Instead, it reduces, instead it reduces both access and protection to ephemeral bargaining chips, if we look at it in a quid pro quo way. What we need for sustainable protection is a bottom-up societal approach. Call it an access approach an approach that involves community and community actors, that empowers these actors and gives them the voice vis-a-vis -vis those bearing arms, that in the long run uh, allows them to be part of the uh, peaceful solution. Let's take, for instance, uh, uh, women and girls. We don't, shouldn't look at them only as vulnerable groups in need of some protection against sexual and gender-based violence, but rather give them the agency as an interlocutor able to claim and reclaim their basic rights. And in that way, empowered people will be accessible and protected at the same time. And in the end, may not even need our assistance anymore. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Andre. Great, great thoughts and, and position to get us started. Um, and let's get into it from here. So before we get started with the videos and hearing from our speakers, we want to have a chance to have a little uh, brainstorming amongst ourselves. And so we'll use the tool of Mentimeter to be able to hear from you all. 
You'll see Natalie's put the link in the chat for the Mentimeter to do a quick poll. And we will have three questions. We have, what does access mean to you? If there's anything that we've learned is access means something to everyone, but it's not always the same. Who needs access? And who holds responsibility for access? Those are the questions that are going to be coming up. So if you can go ahead and click, in, click the link and start entering your answers to there, then we'll start to see those come up on the screen. And we'll get a sense of sort of how we all have a different experience and, and understanding about what, what access is or what do we all, we all see is really the same. Great. We'll give you a few minutes to go ahead and do that. Lots of interesting responses coming in for what does access mean to you? Opportunity, trust, equality, freedom of movement, no obstacles to do something. Precursor to normalization, receiving aid. Wonderful. Opportunity. without discrimination. Oh, this is great. This would make excellent artwork we should all have on our walls. Freedom, la liberté. Answer in any language you like. It doesn't have to be English. It's okay. Wonderful. Liberate. Life with dignity. Fulfilling an obligation. That's interesting. Protection. Great. Natalie, can we go on to the second question? Who needs access? Uh, here they come. Humanitarians, everyone, beneficiaire, people in need, NGOs, personnes vulnerables. Conflicted areas, conflicted affected areas, affected people. Combatants, NGOs, people, the press. So we've got some real contribution do we see here access is important to everyone and it seems like everyone needs some some kind of access great and let's go to the last question who holds responsibility for access local communities security forces duty bearers state authorities, everyone, NGOs, armed actors, people in power, those in power. Government, security entities, great. Ocha, anybody from Ocha on the call? <laughs> Got some heavy responsibilities coming up. Anybody holding power over a territory? Excellent. Good. Okay, Natalie, we can end, we can we can close it up. Thanks so much, everybody, for your participation. It's really interesting to see the, the, the responses coming in and the, the diversity and really a sense of inclusivity. Uh, when we see those answers, we see in essence, everybody, everybody needs access. It means a lot of things and it's really about 
freedom to do what you need to do to do what you want to do in a safe way. Uh, we see that uh, for people affected by conflict and, and deprivation and violence. And we see this for those of us in, in responding and participating who are largely part of the humanitarian community, looking at how we can how we can gain access to two communities who are affected by violence, uh, conflict and deprivation and how we can be in support of as well as to be safe while we're doing that. And then really that there's uh, everybody has a role in access. It's not not just one person, one organization's responsibility, but it is in fact we all have a role to play um, in, in gaining and maintaining and, and securing access. Uh, and that's a great start to our conversation. So thanks everybody uh, for sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, and let's get started and move on to our, our next session. So for, as I said at the introduction, we're gonna have an opportunity to, to, to jump into a couple of different locations. We did it through the use of video um, to make sure that, that we didn't have any challenges with connectivity, uh, you know, the storms or whatever was gonna happen and, and risk not having the opportunity to, to, to really get a sense of what was going on. So we're gonna start with a couple of videos. Um, we'll do them right in succession. So the first one will be from South Sudan and then two short videos right next to each other that'll be about Iraq. And then uh, we'll hand it back over to, to Andre to, to moderate a conversation with our, our speakers, uh, Kuzanai and Reem, who are from working in South Sudan and Iraq, respectively, uh, to talk a bit about what we see in the videos and what their experiences are related uh, to access. Uh, so uh, tech geniuses, can I turn it back over to you and can we get started with the videos? what access means to you as women protection team amati gwerle na sikata alna gido rufogo mikin zaman tanna bigum na grafi ye anna birija o amud zaman tani kaman e munazamat bija birija yan mendu mashake Jaman Anna Gira from Algeria, Anna Gira Quest, Lade Anna Rita, Mata Ajabata. Gal Tegila, the access led to the WPT show. Ah, Tegila, that na best Anna Gaino. Ah, we can na bira fi hilo mashakilat. Ah, I na na Tegila, that na desire. Anna be stakalo, I jal naga in go this kid day abata. Like in my in kid day let yet a moka, I am a de command nasa smile. Mahal dag maquis, nasa nade command big a maki door to mamas and skir de maquis. How has it impacted uh, your lives as women? Yaude, take a little in a cigar dasa de maquis. Cigar de carabo. I can turn the capital of it yet a moka. I am a day a day, Nasmuka de la Cabato, Akili Mafi Nakali, Nas Bagi de Vijibu, Lena, who is killed in a day, Marquess, who Calamta Gian Gaman. As a Gian Bibiga muscular, a jet could be a taman at all garlic, they get bigger, better letter alip. We never can give you the gibbe, Kumsumia Guinea. Molotic in the head, Nedde Bow, Ingolo, Motumido Tado, Gitalia by. Arabia by Naga Majonga Nimoto, who said in a blue lumudi, Monyelo Munda Min, Arabia by Boponda Tan Yala do, Yila Gapulodi, Salago Domutu Donaga in a domoka Iwoto, Da Moka dog Nani Refin, the dog on a set in a lumudi, telephone by Naga do Mapito Janaka de Epitogitina, those I can telephone by Arabia by Napondo. My second day in a meeting, my Majidim, my Ajidim, my Salatindi. And human protection in the WPT, one mind to massacre the Salatin, one in the meeting with the Salatin. Here, massacre will be also for Hila, and not to Umbar, whom we will be sold down. Can Anna Gira, Manjar, Anna Gira, Maguru? Munaza Madeza to Anacande, Munaza Madebe, Jesse, Grimulu, as an Sika de Keresi Bull in Afadi, as an Agiramu to Bejian, Sika, Taumbasi, Mafia Arabia Grafogo, Sika Marquis, Sika Kulu Marquis. Ana zetu kandi na sumo na zamani kidumu limbe ukomadi, 
as un kere mon wodi le na ra ku group de na طبعا السلام عليكم انا بشير من منظمه ام بي من عالم في نشر السلام اليوم نتكلم عن احد القصص اللي واجهتنا مخيم جدعة خمسة قصة جانا اتصال من موظفة الخدمة من منظمتنا فكلمت لأنه أكو أحد النساء في باب المخيم وممنوع أنها تدخل للمخيم فراح نزرناها عرفنا القصة كاملة عنها هي كانت ساكنة بالمخيم بعدين قادرت المخيم عملت مغادرة مع أخوها هم هي يعني من منطقة قريبة على الحدود العراقية السورية فكان أخوها موزين وياها حاول أنه يزوجها مرة ثانية ويطرد الأطفال يتركهم غير مكان هي هربت من ال من بيت أخوها توجهت إلى مخيم جدعة خمسة حاولت تدخل ما قدرت تدخل منعوها القوات الأمنية المتواجدة ومنعتها وزارة الهجرة والمهجرين فأحنا بحكم علاقاتنا الواسعة بالمنطقة وبالضباط الموجودين عن حماية المخيم رح نزرنا وزارة الهجرة والمهجرين قالوا إحنا ما أكو مشكلة بس إذا الشرطة يكونون موافقين بعدين مرة ثانية رحنا للشرطة قالوا إحنا ما أكو مشكلة إذا تدخل للمخيم بس يكون الهجرة موافقين صارت يعني شوية أي شخص يريد يهرب من المسؤولية خلنا نقول الهجرة وال والشرطة ما يريد يتحمل المسؤولية لأنه كانت قرارات جديدة إنه ما حد يدخل عملنا تنسيق وزيارة مرافقة معها إلى مديرة شرطة الغيارة علما أن المرأة كانت لا تملك هويات مستمسكات ثبوتية لأولادها فمن خلال تنسيقاتنا والثقة الموجودة بيننا وبين الضباط بالمديرية أما اتصلوا بقائد عمليات اتصلوا بالهجرة وقدرنا أحنا من اتصل ونحصل الموافقة والمرأة دخلت للمخيم والحمد لله والشكر بدأنا العمل في حردان قبل بضع أشهر اخترنا بشكل استراتيجي الانخراط هنا بحيث كانت القرية دمرتها أحداث داعش سنة 2014-2015 حيث تم تدمير جزء كبير من القرية وقتل عدد كبير من السكان بسبب الاختطاف الآن لا يزال هناك نقص كبير في التقة والغضب بين حردان والقرى المجاورة بالإضافة إلى ذلك كما هو الحال في معظم مناطق سنجار تعاني القرية من ضعف البنية التحتية ونقص الخدمات التي توفرها دائرة البلدية وما إلى ذلك عندما بدأنا التعامل مع مجتمع حردان لأول مرة كانوا معادين لنا ومع المنظمات الغير الحكومية بشكل عام لأنهم يعتقدون أن المنظمات الغير الحكومية تقدم معودا لا تفي بها بعد ذلك منذ أحداث داعش عندما جذبت سنجار الكثير من الاهتمام الدولي ركزت المنظمات غير الحكومية على سنجار وقدم العديد منها وعودا لم تتحقق في حردان نتيجة لذلك يشعر القرويون في حردان بالإهمال واليأس وفقد معدمهم التقة في حسن نية المنظمات غير الحكومية والمنظمات الحكومية الدولية بالعمل فيها من خلال بناء العلاقات مع القرويين في حردان أصبح موقفهم الآن مرنا بشكل ملحوظ تم تحقيق ذلك من خلال من خلال تنشيط الشبكات الاجتماعية لأحد المنظمات غير الربحية لدينا والمخرات في الدبلوماسية المكوكية للمساعدة في حل الاتهامات والنزاع حول المحسوبية في القرية نحن الآن منخرطون في منتديات أمن المجتمعي في حردان والتي من خلالها نستهدف 
إلى مناصر المجتمع وتمكينهم من الوصول إلى الخدمات التي يفتقرون إليها حاليا. في الأسبوع الماضي اتصل بنا المنظمة الدولية للهجرة أنهم يهتمون بالعمل في حردان لأنها منطقة مهمشة لكنهم كانوا قلقين بشأن كيفية التعامل مع المجتمع لأنهم واجهوا مؤخرا مشاكل في منطقة أخرى يعملون فيها في سجاحد وكان هناك احتجاجات بخدماتهم أتت المنظمة الدولية للهجرة إلينا للحصول على المشورة حول كيفية بناء العلاقات في حردان وتجنب المشاكل السابقة التي مروا بها. Great. Okay, well, just before we get started, we're going to hand it over uh, to Andre to moderate a discussion uh, about the subject matter we've just seen. Uh, for everybody who's here, all, all the participants, we'd love to hear from you. So if you have questions about anything that you just saw in the videos or uh, anything that the, the speakers will be talking about, do put them in the chat and we'll see if we can at least pick a couple if we have enough time um, to try and address your questions or comments or feedback that you have. We'd love to hear from you. So let me turn it over to you, Andre. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, and uh, great videos, very powerful messages and, and good to see it in practice. I mean, we can discuss like this in a virtual room uh, a lot, but it's it's best to, to see it in action. And um, some, some interesting points uh, out of these videos, uh, I would say uh, the videos in South Sudan show um, show actually that, that, that protection is not so much about the actual protection. I mean, there was a lot of, a lot of speaking about livelihoods, access and protection was needed so that people can get to the market and, 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 and go to their farm. So very interesting to see that it's, it's exactly that agency kind of, uh, kind of uh, um, aspect. Um, and, and the same goes for the court proceedings uh, where we heard uh, that, that will, you know, women should have access to the proceedings that concern them. Uh, and the, the movies in Iraq showed, I think, very well how... Um, how uh, relationship building, community networks, um, how being engaged over a longer period of time is important in terms of uh, ensuring access and protection. So, so great, great videos. And I'm very glad to, to introduce, um, uh, to, to, to speak to us more about these, these, these videos and about the situation in, in South Sudan and in Iraq and the work of, of um, nonviolent peace force. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to, to welcome Kudzanai uh, Mativirira uh, from South Sudan. Uh, welcome, good to see you on screen, uh, Kudzanai. And uh, uh, Reem uh, Abdullah Abdullah uh, in Iraq. Uh, great to see you here. Um, and, and, and great that you can be here yeah, to yeah. share with us a little bit uh, your thoughts also beyond the, the, the videos we just saw. Um, so maybe, uh, uh, Kudzana, if I, if I can turn to you first, um, uh, as I said, we saw, we saw how, how, uh, the, uh, uh, women uh, protection teams, uh, operate and, and are important, especially to, you know, not only protect and access, but actually to, to go into, to, to, to allow people to go, uh, and, and, and work for their livelihoods. Um, in that respect, um, I, I was wondering if you can say a little bit more about what your experience, uh, what in your experience is important in, in, in essential in terms of gaining access. All right, thank you very much, Andre. I hope everyone can hear me. We hear you good. All right, uh, as, he, as he introduced me, I'm Kuzanai Mativirida and I'm a program manager for NP South Sudan. Uh, looking at the video that was shown, uh, I think you saw that women expressed a lot of challenges and they also talked about access, being the ability to move to the market, the ability to move to the market, and also in some of our locations, the ability to go and fetch firewood for livelihood. If you also look at the, the challenges they presented, you realize that there are many. As nonviolent peace force, I wanted to share with you uh, how we worked with women so that access could be improved. First of all, as an organization, uh, our methodology of an armed civilian protection uh, enables us to always consider the issue of premise of local actors. So in the issue of uh, the formation of uh, the WPTs, we established them so that we would encourage and support them to participate 
in community and security issues, and also ensuring that uh, we facilitate self-protection. So the whole issue is about us as nonviolent non peace force, building the capacity of the women protection teams so that can, they can also have access to basic services and access to livelihoods so that as well as being able to protect themselves and others. So as we work with them, some of the activities that we engage with them is are providing a commandment and protective presence. And as we speak, it's not only NP that does, they, that, that does that. They are also to conduct the patrols independently and jointly with nonviolent peace force. And by doing that, we are also facilitating the issue of sustainability, even if we are not around in South Sudan. The other issue is the issue of accompaniment. Um, we are talking about access. Some survivors might not be able to access services because the situation will be volatile or it will be insecure. So the women are able to accompany the survivors to, 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 to be able to access basic services. Also, we have been building the capacity of women and also advising them, as you saw, they say they are moving in groups. As nonviolent peace force, we also discuss with them and also give some of those advices so that they can move in groups. And at many times when they move in groups, no incidents happen along the way. We also accompany them for them to access services. And we have been engaging with local authorities, government and other humanitarian actors for them to consider the community as a whole. And the other issue is the issue of protection mainstream also allows organization to consider the issue of access. It will enable them to realize that everyone needs access. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kuzora, and, and uh, thank you that you introduced yourself. I should have done that uh, myself, but thanks, uh, thanks for these insights. Um, and uh, I will uh, uh, move. Uh, I will come back to you after, but I will move to to Reem. Uh, Reem has been uh, working in Iraq as a national protection officer, and has a lot of experience in uh, uh, negotiating also with authorities. Uh, Reem, um, we saw in uh, one of the videos on, on Iraq, we saw the importance of, let's say, building trust and, and, and building relations with uh, institutions, but also with the communities. And in particular, uh, there was the issue of uh, a lot of NGOs arriving uh, at, at a certain point, but then not staying around. Maybe using uh, that example, can you can you say a little bit uh, what the success is of non-violent peace force in terms of securing protection and access, um, and and what is it that you do differently? Yes, my name is Reem, and I work for MP in Iraq. Um, I work. So the first video that you saw in Iraq was about the situation um, of the camps and this lady who was uh, in Iraq and then she wanted to go back to her camp, but she wasn't getting the permissions that she needed to go back. This is because of a conflict between her and her brother who took her children from her and she didn't have any documents so that she can enter the re-enter the camp. So it was very, very difficult. But because MP was there and we were working there and um, since the camps were there in the southern Mosul part, um, we managed to work. So in MP, we communicated all the security forces and also the governmental organizations um, and those within the camp. And we have built trust with them and with the community. And therefore, we were able to build the trust between all of them, such as the Ministry of Immigration, because they actually work with the Iraqis in Jordan, especially. And we managed to get permission to allow this lady to go back into the camp who was now living outside the camp, so living on the streets, really. And we managed to get her this permission so that she would return to the camp and to take the tent that she had in the past. And the problem was that she didn't have her ID card and all the documentation that she was required. But because we had built the trust in the security with the security forces in Iraq, who were responsible for the area where the camp was, through that trust and our relationships, 
as I said, we have formal relationships and we used to visit um, all the security forces in the past. So because of this, we managed to get this permission. So this woman would re-enter the camp and we managed to return her ID and all her documentary papers, which were given with her brother, uh, which were with her brother, sorry. So, as I said, building trust and having a relationship is really important, whether it's with the security forces, organizations, or the communities. We continuously continue with, with visits with the security forces, as I said, and with people who sometimes come and visit, and with the society as well, and all other organizations that are there. And I think that when we build such trust and relationships, we are able to succeed. And any problem that we face or any conflict that we face, we are able to resolve by um, allowing the security forces to take part um, to solve these problems. It's the same also with the community leaders who actually manage to impact those who live in the camps or in the area. Now, there's a second story. Can I say it in brief? It's similar to the one we've just uh, shown. This is outside the camp. There were two other stories similar to this. One of the women didn't have a house. She was living on the streets for about maybe a year. So through building trust and relationship with the security forces um, in Nenwa, and the Khayara area, which are close to the air, um, camp, we managed to get permission for her so that she would live in the camp because she had nowhere else to live in. She had no house. And we managed to get that permission so that she would live in the camp, as I said. The second story was also about a woman who was a displaced person who came from a different region, so, but she was unable to go back to that region because let's say all the houses were destroyed because of the war. So we managed to get permission for her because she was unable to get them before. So as I said, she, she, because she came from a different region, she wasn't allowed to live in this region with that permission. So as MP and because of all the trust and the relationships, as I said, with the society, community leaders and security forces and the organizations that work on protection, and GBV and other matters, we managed to get permission. As I said, um, the community leaders needed to accept her because they have to give permission for other families to enter the area. So through the Ministry of Immigration and the Security Forces in Nenewa, we managed to get that permission and she was able to come into the camp. So this is another story similar to the ones we showed in the video. Thank you, Reem, and uh, thank you for, for telling us uh, some additional stories and, and, and they show uh, how important it is uh, to have this uh, long-term relationship. Can I maybe ask a follow-up question briefly? I've, I've heard that the Nonviolent Peace Force uh, does night patrols in the camps as well, and that you're one of the few, if not the only organization that does, does, does these night patrols. Can you say a little bit why this is important and, and what how it benefited the, the organization, but also in the organization in actually achieving a better protection and access. Thank you, Andre. Um, I can give you an example of the Bento protection of civilian sites. Um, as a result of the meetings we were holding with the, the community, with the local leaders, uh, we realized that most of the cases or offenses were happening at night. Initially, we were conducting our patrols during the day. But as I said, this issue of the premise of actors and also our plight for protecting civilians, we started discussing about a strategy we could use. So we started conducting patrols at night. Initially, we were doing the patrols independently, and we realized that during the time when we were conducting the patrols, there were no cases of uh, no case, no crimes reported. As a result of our efforts, we also realized that we managed to even share our good work with other partners, including armies. And at one point, we also managed to influence them to conduct uh, those patrols at night. So meaning our efforts towards uh, the reduction in criminal activities and our efforts to coordinate with other partners led to the decrease in criminal activities and the community appreciated us. 
because they could move freely even at night and during the day. Thank you. Thank you, Kuzanai. And, and Reem, how about uh, in your night patrols in, uh, in the camps? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank thank you. you. The question is a really good one. So the question was about the patrols and their presence in the camps. It's very important, in my opinion, for the organizations and the MP to be present in the camp. We carried out those um, patrols at times, which were nighttime. So this is our second task, because most organizations that work within the camp only work in the daytime, mostly in the mornings. So as a protection agency, um, we should really be in the camps at times such as nighttime. So nighttime is from 4 p.m. until midnight. At that time, there's no other um, organizations there, and even the security forces are away from the camps at that time. So MP um, saw that it was important for it to be present for that period. So they would be there. So we decided, divided um, our times. So some people work in the daytime and others work for that um, evening period. So that any conflict or any problems that occur within the camps, um, we would be there. Otherwise, it would be difficult to solve them. So as I said, any event or incident or any misunderstanding that occurred in the camp was solved through MP. And even when the local authorities of the security forces and the community leaders um, and the community in general saw that we were working um, in that time, that increased the trust in us and people felt more secure through our presence because the organization was there to support them and was working on everything. So I think the presence for that time was really important, which is what we did and this is still carrying on. So we have people who work only evenings just to, to do that, to ensure no new problems arise. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reem. And um, uh, we have been getting some questions also in uh, online from the participants. And one of them, uh, maybe I'll ask uh, first, uh, Kudzanai. Um, what about the, 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 um, the role of the local authorities or those in power when it comes to making sure that the services that NGOs and international governmental organizations can provide in terms of protection and access, uh, what is uh, their role in making sure that these services are sustainable um, and, and, and that the NGOs can actually do their work? Thank you very much, Andre. Uh, with regards to access in South Sudan, sometimes we experience challenges. However, like I said, we've been working with the, the WPTs and also our community-based protection networks, and we have been able to have community meetings and also we have managed to link our community-based protection network with local authorities so that they highlight the issues they are facing. Uh, at times, we see that they also try and uh, mitigate, uh, and we see them coming in. So, but it, it's a continuous process. Uh, sometimes we realize that if you can't manage to convince them, you have to go again and knock on the door. And also, the engagement of uh, various community members within the, uh, the areas where we operate has really helped. Because sometimes it, as an organization, yes, we can go and keep on trying to uh, emphasize the importance of access and also the importance of them, ensuring that they are part of um, the issue of participation. So it's, it's a matter of continuous engagement with them, building trust and relationships so that they also understand the importance of humanitarian partners to themselves and the communities themselves. So it's a continuous process, and it also requires uh, engage, being trusted by the community, being trusted by other partners. It's, um, uh, I can say, it's, it needs a lot of coordination and collaboration. In some areas, it's difficult, but in other areas, it's easy. it depends on maybe the context of an area. 
thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Reem, we have another question uh, from, uh, from uh, one of the participants, uh, in particular a participant from the Democratic Republic of Congo, who is asking about, um, I would say, the security also of not only the people, but also of those, those helping the people, uh, such as non-violent uh, peace force. Uh, they, uh, organizations often depend on the local authorities, on the police forces to protect them, but that is not always uh, the case. Um, so maybe maybe a question to you is uh, how how do you build trust and the bridge with the the local security forces and the local authorities so that you are able to do your work? Yes, it's very important that we build trust and have a relationship with the security forces in the area or in the areas that we work in and also with those who impact the community, because those parties also contribute when it comes to solving some of the problems that occur. And therefore, through them, we can reach service, uh, deliver services as well. So how do we build trust and relationship with them? Through visits, and also by participating in some activities, and also by knowing them, and for them to know uh, our employees and our organization, so that they know what MP is and what activities it carries out. So, as I said, through knowing them and building such a relationship, we can solve any problem. Um, and also, as I said, through visits, when we carry out such visits, as we said, there's uh, quite a few people who work in the security visit uh, forces, so we have to carry out visits and we do these every fortnight or every four weeks, maybe so that uh, they make sure that they know us really well. This is the best way to build the trust, as I said, by continuous visits. And through this, we can solve any problem that we face. Now, for example, we had one lady in the community that was unable to reach the security forces or was unable to solve some problems that they were facing. Um, because in the community, they, as I said, they're always scared of going and going to the security forces because they're armed. So there is some in inherent fear there, but through the, uh, in the uh, camp in southern Mosul, um, we had a group especially for women where they tell us what their problems are. And then we also have people who come from the security forces and we told them not to worry about them, even if they are armed. And these security forces agreed to come to those meetings unarmed. And therefore it was a successful meeting. And through that meeting, the women managed to communicate with the security forces with ease and with no fear. And they were telling them what problems they were facing. And the community leaders also were present, and especially the um, women that impact the, uh, the community, they were there as well. And therefore, all the, the community got to know who they were, and they were able to tell them what the problems were. And they were also able to identify which um, security force they would need to go to, you know, which governmental um, entity they need to go to. So they were able to identify those. And we actually gave them a roadmap of all the service, governmental services on offer and which unit does what and what solve what problems they face and so on and what times they were available for them to listen to the community and therefore all the problems were easier to communicate thank you thank you very much uh, thank you very much Kudzanai and uh, Reem uh, we have to move to the next uh, part of the the, the program but uh, thanks uh, for for being here with us and thanks for your very important work in the places where it uh, matters most um, and thank you for the people uh, joining us uh, for their questions uh, unfortunately we cannot uh, ask all the questions you have been posting in the chat uh, but um, uh, we continue so there might be another opportunity thank you very much Thank you, Andre. Thanks, everybody. That was a great discussion and, and great to see all the engagement in the chat the area. There was questions and comments, and we've been trying to collect them all. Uh, we're learning from you, uh, from your own experiences and your own reflections, and that's all really helpful to consider. Uh, we'll now move on to the next set of videos. Uh, so we'll see two videos now, one from Sudan and one from Ukraine, and then we'll do the same thing. We'll have a discussion about them. So more opportunity to engage. Uh, tech wizards, let me turn it back to you. Let's go ahead and see the videos. 
in April 2022, NP sent a fact-finding mission to document civilian protection challenges in Lviv, Kyiv, Dnipro, Zaporizhia, Odessa, Mykolaiv, Kharkiv, and Chihuiv. Our teams prioritized identifying civilian protection needs and priorities, specifically in the hard-to-reach and frontline areas with the focus on civilians exposed to vulnerabilities, namely the elderly and people with special needs. Christina, I am here with Nonviolent Peace Force. We are an international humanitarian organization that provides protection, unarmed protection to civilians in conflict zones. Today we are in Kharkiv, one of the cities that has been affected by the violent conflict in Ukraine most. Behind me you see a damaged apartment block, a huge building that has been hit by a missile. We've spent this afternoon talking with some residents that were able to escape most of the fire and are now sheltering um, in accommodation nearby. Ongoing violence, reluctance or inability of older people and those with disabilities or health concerns to evacuate closures of public transport and essential businesses and socioeconomic disadvantage have compounded and create situations in which people with special needs are isolated and unable to access services. Where these populations have been identified, the majority burden of providing support has been placed on the self-organized local volunteers. During the mission assessment period, MP engaged with a variety of local stakeholders, including women's centers, human rights activists, religious leaders, representatives of the Ukrainian government, volunteer collectives, civil society organizations, national non-governmental organizations, and emergency response teams. It became quickly clear that these groups are leading the humanitarian response in Ukraine. Uh, I don't know, do you have the app, mobile app with... So understanding that the humanitarian machine moving into Ukraine is very hierarchical and the response that is most effective is coming from local organizations and civilian-led volunteer mechanisms. NP's unique responsibility in this is to be the bridge, gapping, being the bridge to fill the gap between the on-the-ground local organizations and then the humanitarian structures that would be able to provide the, the much-needed service provision. Despite the leading role of local actors in frontline efforts, the vast majority of resources remain concentrated with international agencies. Although some of the local humanitarian organizations interviewed by NP have partnered with international actors to receive funding to conduct such operations, more support is needed. Frontline efforts are further hampered as a result of damaged civilian infrastructures. The Russian forces are continuously targeting Ukraine's power stations, causing massive blackouts across the country. Residents are being urged, and in some cases forced by circumstances, to conserve water and energy. Destruction of houses and lack of access to fuel and electricity due to damaged infrastructure could become a matter of life or death. To support self-protection strategies already adopted by local organizations and help them better observe safeguarding and do-no-harm principles while implementing humanitarian activities, MP has began delivering trainings on unarmed civilian protection. Training contents have included introduction to unarmed civilian protection methods at MP's values and principles, namely nonviolence, primacy of local actors. In anticipation of the fast approaching winter months, MP aims to continue to support the hyper local response structures, focus on civilian protection, and the delivery of aid. Ukrainian women's networks have been central to the humanitarian aid response here in Ukraine. Um, we've met with a number of women's networks who are running shelters, who are running evacuation networks, moving women and children from the east and the south, areas that have been occupied or under threat by the Russian forces, and moving them into Western Ukraine and, and into Europe as well. So um, the, the humanitarian response has been incredibly women-led, incredibly youth-led, and it's been such a privilege to see. Hi, um, this is Nonviolent Peace Force here today in uh, West Darfur in the locality of Kerenik. Uh, we're in a nomads community about nine kilometers away from the town of Kerenik called Urusi. And uh, Kerenik is a town that a couple of months ago um, was attacked. It's the fifth time since 2021 that it was attacked. 
um, and about 200 people were killed, many homes were destroyed and many people were displaced towards the largest town in West Darfur called El Janina. <laughs> In July of this year, Nonviolent Peace Force conducted its first outreach mission to Kerenik locality. The team visited Kerenik town itself, the site of the attack, as well as three nomadic Arab villages in the surrounding areas. The NP team engaged with community members, community leaders, government authorities and humanitarian actors. Yeah, going to Karanik, uh, West Darfur was not an easy ride. Reach out far reach isolated community. The trust is important. And during the training in Galala, we were able to earn the trust. How did we do that? I would say it's all about human interactions. Sitting with the community, sharing a meal, tea, coffee, listening to their stories without judgment make the difference. Even during the workshop, our team enhanced the relationship with the community, including the community leaders. I am sure community felt that effort of nonviolent peace force to protect the community. So Galala community in Karanik locality welcome us and protect us. I feel that human relationship is magical. So we deeply believe that relationship building is key to access the community. NP, using its non-partisan approach, recognized the importance of working with all members of the community. Rather than target just the displaced, non-nomadic communities, as has been common in the humanitarian system in recent years, NP has chosen to devote equal attention to both sedentary and nomadic peoples. Uh, uh, since this first mission, NP has now established firm enough contacts that the team can feel safe moving between villages, moving between nomad and sedentary villages, using our relationships as our means of security. The team has been travelling regularly to Kerenik, building relationships, gathering protection concerns and devising strategies to seek to address some of the protection concerns that communities are raising. وكذلك الحماية وغيرها من الدعم 
لكن ام بي جات بحاجه تختلف تماما من الحاجه اللي كانوا الناس متوقعينها هي ان هي تقدم السلام نفسه يعني وتخلي الناس بعدها ما يكونوا محتاجين لل للدعم حتى يعني لو تحقق السلام يكون ثاني ما في نزوح ما في لجوء ما في حوجه للغذاء ولا للكساء ولا للحمايه يعني ففعلا برنامج بتاع ام بي برنامج هادف ونتمنى انه المنظمات تمشي في الاتجاه ده يعني تعزز السلام وتبني السلام بين المجتمعات. The what the reflection that they told us is that the access to the nomad community is not been happening by the other humanitarians who are working in a humanitarian field. But NP made it to have access very simple because they say the approach that NP is uh, giving them is really touchable. It is uh, is like going with their life, their normal life. It is reflecting their normal life. It's not about the luxury, but it is about how they examine it, how they examine those tools. So the NP tools, protection tools, are completely different. And they told us, this means NP, if NP enter any place, it will make uh, well, great. Well, thanks. I hope you all enjoyed to see a little insight into two um, areas affected by violent conflict in Ukraine and Sudan and Darfur specifically. Uh, and we are going to welcome our speakers uh, to discuss uh, their experiences in these locations. Uh, just a reminder, again, the chat is open. So if you have questions um, or comments about anything you saw in those videos or, or things that you'd like to ask the speakers, please go ahead and we'll do our best to try and at least get to a couple of them. Uh, our, we did have a speaker that you heard in the video, Jaunty, um, who had dialed in uh, with us from Darfur, uh, who was supposed to be part of our panel right now unfortunately as these things happen he has lost connectivity um so we have uh to speak in his place will be hubert oldenhus who is our global director of programming for nonviolent peace force and together um with our colleague christina who is in ukraine who you heard doing uh the narration and you saw in the video so uh christina let me start with you Welcome. Hi. Morning. Hi. Hi. Good to see you. Thanks. <laughs> Great. Glad we've got connectivity. Uh, we were a little worried about that as well. Um, some of the work that you guys have been doing is, has been really focused on areas that have have not had a, uh, much uh, presence from from a humanitarian external humanitarian response. Uh, so specifically, I was wondering if we could ask you about um, the work that you guys have done um, in gaining access to Mikolaev and maybe share with the people how you did that. Go ahead from there. Yes, yes, absolutely. And thank you for this quick question. Um, as briefly mentioned in the video, we first arrived to Ukraine to conduct an assessment. And during that time, it became quickly apparent that the areas that our teams would want to focus and see ourselves potentially adding value to the ongoing humanitarian response were the hard to reach frontline communities. So we've identified um, three operational bases, um, which are um, established. I'm very glad to inform that they are now fully operational. So we have offices in Odessa, Nikolaev, and Kharkiv. And specifically in Nikolaev and Kharkiv, the presence of international humanitarian actors is incredibly limited. That is partially due to security protocols that the international humanitarian organizations have to abide by, and that does not mean that um, having presence, presence in these war affected areas is impossible. So throughout the last few months, MP has continuously showed up in Nikolaev city, uh, building relationships with local volunteer collectives, with national non-governmental organizations, with self-organized groups that came together following February events as the needs presented themselves. And again, I couldn't stress how important this is and, and true it is. These groups are the ones that know what the concerns are on the ground and how to best address them. There's so much capacity on the ground and it has, it has been there even before 2014. So the way that we uh, try and operate in Ukraine is less about building capacity and, and trying to, um, to show how to address civilian protection concerns. Rather, we focus on supporting the existing local uh, response mechanism, mechanisms, making sure that they can sustain themselves as we're counting the eighth 
months on, of, of the war. So specifically in Nikolaev, we have developed close relationships with volunteer collectives um, that we help support through trainings. We provide um, protective accompaniments and protective uh, presence to their activities. We make sure that they um, have um, access to personal protective equipment and um, to first aid kits that they are aware of safeguarding and do no harm principles and how to best embed them in their activities. A major issue that we're seeing in the Kalaev is that because so many international organizations choose to not operate in the city, they're asking volunteers to come all the way to Odessa, pick up material supplies, and then distribute them on their behalf. And while they're doing that, they're not providing a local volunteer collectives with any personal protective equipment. Um, these volunteers are going to frontline communities in their own personal vehicles that carry bullet um, marks and they have uh, very limited support in terms of first aid kits and they're really putting their own personal safety and security at risk to continue these efforts and they're getting of course you know stipends and and as again we're counting the eighth month of the war people are looking for stable sources of, of income to support their families and and the situation again is is, is really dynamic and difficult so uh, with, uh, with NP, as NP, we've been doing our best uh, to help provide these volunteer collectives with everything they need so they can sustain their activities. Um, and that has given them access to protection and it has given us, NP, access to the harder to reach uh, frontline community. Great, thank you, Christina. And Hubert, what we have seen in common with these two two particular examples from Ukraine and also the situation that was described uh, for Karenik in Darfur is these are areas that are currently have recently and currently experienced very high levels of violence. So get get our are considered high security, high risk, dangerous locations. And of course, for humanitarian organizations, even uh, you know, no matter how difficult or how much we want to reach different locations, we also have to consider security. And so can you sort of help us sort of look at some of the aspects of, of um, building access to be able to reach those really more insecure, more dangerous locations? Sure. Um, I must say, first of all, it is difficult. There's no easy answers to, 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 to this. Um, but what I've, what I've seen very much in, in different locations and especially in, in the in the location of, of Sudan and Ukraine, which is discussed, is, is the aspect of creativity, is the aspect of, of persistence. Um, for example, in the, in the situation of uh, Sudan, of, of Darfur, um, <clears throat> it was also a matter of that like, we wanted to get into these places without um, an armed escort. Um, of course, a, a lot of the humanitarian organizations going in with armed escorts uh, we could not talk about unarmed protection with, and while going into an un, uh, with an armed escort, and that's not something that we do. Um, and also, armed escorts kind of make make uh, set, set the tone for a more militarized approach, which is difficult. Um, and so, it requires some more kind of uh, creativity and really deep engagement with communities. Uh, in that particular example, it was very interesting to see um, how the communities just uh, how the NP teams just approached the community and had long conversations and just went, went up to the community leaders. Uh, time uh, Maybe the first time is if people are not understanding it, don't, don't want to collaborate. But the first time, no, uh, today, no, doesn't mean that tomorrow is also no. And so it requires kind of ongoing conversations. Uh, in that particular case in Sudan, um, at some point, the team had like uh, the community leader said, "Okay, I understand what you want to do here. I will join with you in in the car, and we'll go there together." And then the community leader on the other side of the community said, "I will join too because you need me as well because to deal with uh, the, the the community on the other side." And so at some point, they had both the community leaders together traveling into that area, and that may sort of take some extra time to get there. But once you you, you do get there. Um, you have a lot more trust coming in and then you can sort of take that and build on because you're coming with the community. Uh, we're seeing that time and again as well. Uh, and I saw that it's in, in places like Myanmar and, and Philippines as well, um, where local actors also struggle. How do I talk to the military? They don't want to see me. Uh, sometimes people get really creative and they have to go to the golf course and have uh, tried to sort of 
play golf with the military or they, they approach the, the wife, the local commander and have brunch with them um, and sort of get access to a military leaders in that way. And so there is this often a creativity involved and a persistence of like sometimes nine or 10 times and you find the entry point and that sort of gets you further. Um, I also I remember from, from being in Ukraine uh, with Christina, um, it was difficult in the beginning. And so how do you find access? And, and that comes with uh, trying to make yourself useful sometimes and sort of, and that it's not always like doing the thing that you came there to do, um, but sometimes it means uh, helping out on, on on a thing that you had not considered and very practically making yourself useful. And then people see, okay, um, I need some help with this. Can you do that? we are driving around a local mediator in South Sudan as well before we sort of, we get an entry point in. And so sometimes we need to think outside of the box of what we came in to do uh, and be a bit creative. And I think the team in, uh, in, in Ukraine really demonstrated that um, by, by making themselves useful. And that builds trust um, and that gets you further. Uh, maybe one last thing that I can add to that as well is um, there's lots of um, misunderstandings and miscommunications in conflict affected areas where local communities may not talk to each other. They may be afraid of talking to the military, the police. Um, and so sometimes it, even by just going out and clarifying the different uh, parties, uh, in one of the videos in Iraq, you saw that as well, where we say, we go to the police. And they said like, okay, talk to the government. And then the government said, talk to the police. Sometimes they don't talk to each other. And so by communicating that and sharing that information, Sometimes the actors see that, hey, wait a minute, you are actually clarifying things and it is useful what you're doing. And, and when you're staying a little bit within your lane and you're not going into um, kind of accusatory uh, language of like, this is this violation should be addressed and that, but you're really keeping it a bit quiet and under the radar um, and, and making yourself useful in very practical ways, um, you, you often do build that access and trust. So let me keep it there. Thanks, Hubert. You're really touching on some of the things that certainly within Nonviolent Peace Force, we say to ourselves every day uh, that we need persistence, creativity and flexibility when we're doing this kind of work. Uh, there's no such thing as a singular solution or a singular approach to all of these very complex and difficult uh, situations that we all find ourselves in. And, and that is, there's always a way forward. There's always a way to be practical and useful. It's just not always the thing that you start with. And that's really a good reminder. Uh, Christina, in, in Ukraine, you guys have been doing some very interesting work that I would say really embraces both a access and protection and access for protection and vice versa in supporting uh, uh, people who have lost their documents, their important legal documents, um, and, and don't have access to be able to get to the places where that they can uh, to safely get there to be able to, to reapply for those documents. Can you tell us a little bit about that work? Yes, of course. Uh, it is in fact a huge problem in in the oblasts um, that are now um, being deoccupied. A lot of people find themselves without personal documentation, whether it was because um, their properties had been shelved or perhaps they had left thinking they could return and then um, never found their homes in place. Um, because they could, the, the territories got occupied. Some have never had a passport before and now are in need um, uh, to get it. And the reasons, um, of course, depend on each individual case. Um, however, without passport, without personal documentation at the moment, you're unable to go to the bank to withdraw money or access any other banking services. You're unable to apply for humanitarian aid if you are an internally displaced person, say um, you had to flee her son and you're now residing in Nikolai. You're unable to, uh, to get food packages because uh, due to donor reporting and all sorts of bureaucratic measures, you have to prove your identity upon uh, receiving material aid. So it cre creates huge impediments to civilians. Also, those with special needs that could apply for specific stipends to help support their conditions as they're trying to get uh, appropriate medication. So our teams have been providing protective accompaniments um, to civilians residing in the collab, so be their medical uh, Nikolaev residents themselves or uh, people that had fled Kherson. 
and we're accompanying them to Odessa, where at the moment you have the only operational um, immigration office where you can apply for um, personal documentation. We do this activity in cooperation with local partners to make sure that um, civilians uh, get access to aid uh, through getting um, their documentation issued. Um, and if I may add, while listening to uh, Hubert talk and how important it is to build trust with the communities that you're trying to do this work with, it really came to my mind uh, the frustration of some of these local volunteer collectives um, that they experience when meeting with international actors. Um, we're hearing a lot of stories where uh, these collectives admit that they have spoken with many international partners, but they come, they ask their questions, they gather their data, and they never, they never return. And whatever promises they had put to help um, get access to particular material aid or uh, to help support with operational cost, they never follow through. So a major way for us to build that trust is to, again, continuously show up. Um, and this is why in places like Nikolaev and Kharkiv, we have been conducting service mapping exercises through which we identify all of the currently active organizations within those oblasts with the intention to establish partnerships with them, with the intention to advocate for their needs and connect them with international organizations, including donors, so that they could ask for financial support and also to establish referral pathways so we could um, continue building that trust and, and seek each other's support when we come across specific civilian protection concerns, specifically as it pertains to um, the elderly and, and people with disabilities. Um, so it, it crossed my mind Hubert, when I was um, hearing your comment. Thanks, Christina. Yeah, that's really helpful. Uh, we're getting, we have a few questions in the chat coming up. Hubert, I'm going to ask you this one. There's a couple of questions related to, to the presence of armed escorts so the, for humanitarian access or ha humanitarian convoys. Uh, do you think armed escort is a viable option for humanitarian access in conflict situations wherein government forces are involved? Could you reflect a little bit on that question? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I have not done a, a proper assessment on sort of the different forms of, of, of escort, armed escorts and, and services that people provide. So um, I, within NP, it's, it's, uh, it's not something that we do. But of course, like I said before, we are, uh, we are our trademark is, is providing unarmed protection. And so it is very important for us to not sort of use um, armed kind of protection to come in and we're sending a different message. What that means for other people, um, uh, I don't know. Um, I do know that sort of what I can see is that the uh, armed escorts, especially when, when government forces are involved, um, people are kind of mistrusting that deeply. Um, I, I can also see when we're not sort of bringing in armed escort, even by the fact that we're coming in, uh, people are often uh, already mistrustful. Uh, are you spies of the government? Are you spies of the armed group? So we're coming already in with a lot of trust, uh, a lot of mistrust, I think, and that needs to be earned. Um, and if you then on top of that bring uh, an armed escort that is related to a specific party in the conflict, um, you will have, have to work a lot harder to overcome that mistrust. So you're starting with a huge obstacle. So for me, it's like, it's more of a question, can you, can you find ways first of, of getting in without an armed escort? And to us, to, in our experience, communities have been, have been always very su supportful in gaining access, like the example I just mentioned, um, where they are kind of saying, we will get you access. We, um, we are building the trust with community leaders and they will um, get us the access that we're needing. The trouble, they may trouble with us to get the access and deal with people uh, that are, they may be a threat to us specifically um, by uh, bringing in the right people who can deal with specific checkpoints and so forth. I don't know if there are specific cases where armed escorts uh, are okay. Um, I think everyone needs to uh, decide that for themselves. But, but I think even there, uh, it could be uh, a deep involvement with the community on how that is organized and how that is uh, being done uh, could, I think, be very beneficial. Tiffany, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. 
Great. Yeah. Thanks, Hubert. I mean, I think it's just it, it, it how we act. It depends on as 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 you've you've commented on on, on who which organization, what your mandate is, and what what the the relationship you have, um, and what your work is. So yeah, you're speaking very much from the nonviolent peace force perspective, um, and and I think like with everything we do, it's really it, these are really complicated questions to ask and and there's it there's a lot of factors to consider so from from our perspective you know it's it's because of the type of work that we do and the way that we are as an organization uh we choose not to work with armed escorts but we certainly do understand there are circumstances um for other organizations and agencies when, when that is needed and that is the case and particularly when it's rapidly getting in in life-saving uh, humanitarian relief we, we absolutely there's different 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 approaches to different circumstances uh, we're getting close to um, uh, wrapping up, but uh, Christina, I'm just going to ask you a little question that came up earlier um, in, in the chat is just really like about challenges. I mean, we like to talk about what works and what we're feeling really good about uh, and 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 that side of it. But what you know, as you've you know, been there now for several months and really working on these really difficult issues, what would you what what pops up to in your mind or sort of what are the most significant challenges and sort of creating access for protection while while you're doing this work? Um, thanks for this question, Tiffany. Actually, the first word that comes to my mind is uh, coordination. We found it really challenging to bridge the gap between the local response and the international response in Ukraine. Um, there is a big a humanitarian machine now up and running in the country, and it sometimes seems quite remote to the challenges experienced on the ground. And as we do try to remain forward leaning and really focus on the areas, our areas where the needs are highest, the biggest challenge is actually to make sure the referral systems function and that there is a communication and trust between actors involved in their response. And we're trying to solve this challenge by increasing our coordination efforts, by building, strengthening our relationships with international and local actors. In fact, um, one way that we're doing that is by um, organizing an event here in Odessa during which we're going to bring um, all of our partners, international and local, together to create a platform where they can discuss their needs openly and then use the time to connect with one another and discuss ways that they can service people in the harder to reach rural um, territories and along frontline areas. And that really means that we need to put all of our efforts towards decentralizing aid to make sure that it's not only concentrated within the metropolitan areas of places like Odessa, Lviv, Dnipro and Kiev, but that it reaches the outskirts and the rural areas of, of those cities um, where people are residing still because they're unable to evacuate due to financial constraints or because they're simply unwilling or even incapable. Uh, not capable uh, to leave um, their hometowns due to disability or any other issues. So it, we're really trying to push for this and advocate for the decentralization of aid to make sure that it reaches uh, communities that are in most need. Thanks, Christina. What a great comment to end on the issue of sort of decentralizing aid. We talked a lot about this at the opening ceremony for the week yesterday, and I know it'll come up throughout the week is, is what are the concrete things that we can do depending on what role that we play, whether it's at the global level or regional um, or international or local organizations. Coordination, of course, we we all know it's part of all of our jobs and it's always the most difficult thing, uh, one of the most difficult things that we do. And the, the real tendency to it to, to um, be efficient and have everything centralized. And when in reality, the way to be most impactful and to to remember what not not how we do it or what we do, but why we do it, which is in support of people who are absolutely the most impacted, starting from there and working our way backwards for those who are most impacted by violence and deprivation, uh, those at, at the at the uh, part of the equation who have at that moment in time, the least access to power uh, and are therefore in the, the most need of amplification and support to be able to do that. Uh, and that does require a more creative engagement than sometimes we do when we are uh, uh, being quick and efficient. 
Uh, well, great. I just want to really thank everybody for your participation, uh, to all of the speakers, uh, to Andre, uh, my co-moderator, and for his opening remarks and, and, and co-host, uh, for your time and attention today. This is, this has, uh, been great to spend this time together. The chat's been live and active. I see there's lots of, the lots, if you want to continue the conversation, uh, for any of us from Nonviolent Peace Force, our email addresses are our first initial. So in my case, T and our last names at nonviolentpeaceforce.org or please find our website and you can probably find our, our just our general contacts there. I've seen a few people ask for contacts, so please we welcome uh, your information. I've been trying to capture in the chat addresses and, and names of organizations that you've been sharing so that we can also be in touch. Uh, we've got so much to learn from each other and so much work to do together. Uh, and, and, and so this is, this is a great opportunity to be together in this moment. So just as we wrap up and reflect on, on, on where we started, we really thought about access as something that when we talk about it really in the humanitarian architecture, we, the, the real risk is we start thinking about, oh, it's somebody's job. Somebody has to be an access coordinator an organization um, or, or uh, a, an entity has to hold the singular responsible for access. And I think what we heard from everybody here who's doing all this great and interesting work and having different experiences is that access is something we all need and it's everybody's responsibility. So while maybe for some people it's in our titles and maybe for some of us it's not, but it really is based in, in relationship building, in trust building, and most importantly, particularly for those of us coming from the outside into areas that are affected by violence, by conflict, by deprivation, is that we're coming into somebody else's home, whether it's literally into their home, into their, their literal home where they live with their family, into their community, into their schools, into their hospitals, whether we're from, from an international organization or even a local organization, but not from that community. Uh, and that access is not permanent. So if somebody does agree to welcome us, in and to work together, that it's not a singular moment in time where we negotiate access and it is complete. It's an impermanent state and it's really part of a longer, more complicated period of, of engagement that's really about moving forward, building those relationships and co-creating, doing this work together. Uh, and, and we make mistakes and when we make mistakes, we have to uh, correct them and we pick ourselves up and we move forward. Uh, and it's that persistence and creativity and flexibility that will really help us all move towards a world that is more integrated and we are more interconnected and therefore we are all safer and we're all able to live more full lives uh, as we as we move forward. So thanks again, everyone. Thanks to the tech team who've done brilliant work uh, keeping us going, uh, really reduce the, the stress on all of us who are working on content. Thank you for you, Hubert, for jumping in at the last minute when we lost contact with our colleague in Darfur, Andre, Kudzi, Rem, Christina. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to everybody. Uh, and enjoy the rest of the week.